Good morning. The message today is from Jeremiah 9, 23 to 24. If you will, please turn to that passage. This will be the basis of our sermon this morning. You may also want to mark 1 Corinthians chapter 1, as we will be looking at that passage as well. Jeremiah 9, 23 to 24. Thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his mind. Nor let the rich man glory in his riches. But let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord, exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these I delight, says the Lord. Jeremiah 9 is a sorrowful lament for fallen Israel. As you read the chapter, you see that this lamentation is briefly interrupted with our text today, Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24 where the prophet Jeremiah pauses briefly to write of man's only ground for boasting. If man is to glory, glory in this. The only hope for men lies in the loving kindness, the judgment, and the righteousness of the Lord. The wise, the mighty, and the rich of Israel had forgotten the Lord turning from him to follow their own way. Israel had forgotten his law, had not obeyed his voice, but instead, according to Jeremiah in Jeremiah 9 and 14, walked according to the dictates of their own hearts. Rather than following the law and will of God, they went according to their own will and way. The prophet Jeremiah teaches us that True religion consists in the knowledge of the Lord and in walking according to his way and being committed to those qualities delighted and displayed by the Lord. Our first point today is do not boast in yourselves. Jeremiah 9 and verse 23. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom let not the mighty man glory in his mind, nor let the rich man glory in his riches. The prophet Jeremiah proclaims the word of the Lord. Do not glory in yourselves. He sh shouts, he exhorts for Israel, for the wise not to glory in their wisdom, for the mighty not to glory in their might and for the rich not to glory in their riches. In the world, men boast of their wisdom. They boast of their might. They boast of their riches. However, in the end, these things prove vain. The term translated glory in this passage is elsewhere rendered as praise and boast. In our text of Jeremiah 9, other versions read boast for the word glory in this passage. Jeremiah 4 and verse 2, for instance. Jeremiah 4 and 2, he says, And you shall swear the Lord lives in truth, in judgment, and in righteousness. The nations shall bless themselves in him, and in him they shall glory. Note the word glory in the last part of Jeremiah 4 and 2. Same word as rendered glory here in this passage. Jeremiah 20 and verse 13, Jeremiah the prophet wrote, Sing to the Lord, praise the Lord, for he has delivered the life of the poor from the hands of the evildoers. And again, the word praise in that passage is the same word translated as glory here in this passage of Jeremiah 9 and 23. And one last example, Psalm 44 and verse 8. In God we boast all day long and praise your name forever. 
Again, the term boast here is translated from the same term elsewhere rendered as glory, praise, and boast. And so here in this passage, we see that the prophet Jeremiah is exhorting the people through the Lord, do not boast in yourselves. There were those who were wise, who might boast or glory in their own wisdom. Instead, give glory to the Lord for his wisdom. There were those who were strong, who were mighty, who might glory in their own might or in their own strength. Instead of praising or boasting themselves, give glory to God in his strength to save. Nor let the rich man glory in his riches. There were rich men, rich people who might glory in their own riches or boast about their own wealth. Instead, give glory to God for all the great riches of his blessings. Number two, glory in the Lord. Jeremiah 9 and 24, but let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord, exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these I delight, says the Lord. You might be wise, rich, mighty. However, Jeremiah here of the Lord is saying, do not glory in your own personal wisdom. Do not glory in your own personal might or do not glory in your own personal riches. Instead, he says, glory in the Lord. It's not that we are to glory in our own understanding or in our own knowledge as if to boast. Instead, glory in the understanding and the knowledge of the Lord in praise of him. Such knowledge shows that the Lord exercises and delights in loving kindness, righteousness, judgment. Acknowledging glory, the God above, the God as the source of all blessings. James in the New Testament, the disciple James in 1 and 17 wrote, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights. The hope of man is in the Lord. And so we glory in him. There are three qualities which the Lord is said to exercise. Three qualities which the Lord is said to delight. Loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness. The first, first and foremost, loving kindness. Loving kindness is defined as being tender or benevolent affection. Tender and benevolent affection. Other versions read steadfast love and kindness. But when we think of love and kindness, we see how God delights in tender and benevolent affection, how he shows mercy and grace because of his love. Because of his love, he shows kindness. Because of his love, he shows mercy and grace. Second, God delights and exercises judgment. Other versions read justice. And so God delights in what is just, in conformity to what is right. We ought to do the same in our loving kindness, but also in our justice, that we do what is just, that we delight in what is fair and good. And number three, righteousness. God delights in what is right. If you were to look at this list from the opposite end, instead of loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness, reverse the list. Righteousness, judgment, and loving kindness. Righteousness, the idea of what is right. Judgment, and so the idea of justice, what is just based upon what is right, based on righteousness. But most importantly, again, we see loving kindness. 
and the capacity because of her love, because of God's love, to show mercy and grace to us. We as followers of Christ ought to have these qualities in our lives today, that we delight and practice these things too. As godly people, we behave as God is said to behave here in these verses. Righteousness is concerned with what is right, a standard of what is right. Judgment and justice, or justice, is justly based upon the standard of righteousness. Again, however, there is loving kindness by which considerations of mercy and compassion are made. It's not a matter of God simply loving what is right and doing judging, being just, based upon what is right, but also making that judgment based upon his own love and kindness, his mercy and compassion. If not for that, where would any of us be as far as salvation? Loving kindness is that quality of character which prompts God or, or man to show consideration to one another. Whether or not consideration is deserved or whether it is expected, think of what loving kindness can do for society. Think too of what love can do for us. Think of God's commitment to his people. What, might, what application might we make of this? Well, wisdom, might, and riches are beneficial when properly used. There's nothing innately wrong with any of these, wisdom, might, or riches. Someone can be very wise, can be very strong, or can be very wealthy, and that's not necessarily wrong. However, these are secondary to the knowledge of God. Instead of glorying in these things, glory in the Lord. Use these things to promote the will of God. True religion consists of knowing the Lord, the things which he delights in and practices, and practicing those things ourselves. And so, second, we see glory in the Lord. Third, trust in Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 30 to 31 reads, but of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that, as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. Let's note what Paul writes here. 1 Corinthians 1 and 30, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. Should sound familiar from what we saw in Jeremiah. Here, Paul quotes from the prophet Jeremiah. He who glories, let him glory in this. Let him glory in the Lord, Paul says. So Paul here gives us a summary of what Jeremiah said in our text today. Let's note the context of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Again, if you will, turn from Jeremiah now to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 in verses 10 through 17, we see how Paul condemned divisions and taught unity. He had heard that there were those who were having contentions over who baptized who. Instead, Paul returns the focus to the preaching of the gospel of Christ. 1 Corinthians 10 to 17 now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same things, that there be no divisions among you, and that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you 
except Crispus and Gaius, lest anyone should say that I baptized in my own name. Yes, I also baptized the house of Stephanos. Besides, I do not know whether I baptized any other, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. And so here in this passage, Paul condemns the vision, and he commends, exhorts the brethren in unity. He had heard again how there were contentions among the brethren, how they were fighting with one another over who baptized who. Well, I was baptized by Paul. Well, I was baptized by Cephas. Well, Paul points out that this was wrong. It's not that Paul did not preach baptism, which he did. It's just that Paul was sent to preach the gospel, the good news. Mark 16, 15, and 16, Jesus said, Go in all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. He who does not believe shall be condemned. Here the problem was the division and how they were glorying in of, over who baptized who. Instead, they ought to have gloried in the gospel and the cross of Jesus Christ. Verses 18 to 25 Paul expounded on the gospel of Christ, the message of the cross, and the power of God unto salvation. He said, to those who are perishing, the cross is foolishness. However, we see God and how he made the wisdom of this world foolish in that the world itself did not know God. God used the world to consider foolish to save those who believe. The wisdom and strength of God is far greater than that of man. And so, 1 Corinthians 1, 18 to 25, he wrote, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved by it is the power of God. This sounds familiar, Romans chapter 1, where Paul says that the gospel of Christ is the power of God unto salvation to those who believe, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Here he continues in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 19, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, but it, it pleased God through the foolishness of preaching, foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For the Jews request a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom, but we see Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness, but to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God, the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. And so here we see the wisdom of God. Paul preaches the gospel of Christ. There were those who did not believe, who were perishing in their sins, who thought it foolish. But Paul says those who are being saved by it, certainly they do not think it's foolish. And to them, they see the wisdom of God. And so the power of God on the salvation, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Verses 26 to 31. Here Paul speaks of the character of the Corinthian congregation as evidence of the wisdom of God. Verse 26, For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are mighty, and the base things of the world and the things which are despised God has chosen the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are, and that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us the wisdom from God, and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. And so here Paul uses the character of the Corinthian congregation as evidence of God's wisdom. A bit of a history lesson, Acts chapter 18, verse 8, 
describes the beginning of the Corinthian church. And here in this passage, we see how Luke records how, the, how Paul preached the gospel to the Corinthians, that Jesus is the Christ, and how those who heard the gospel believed on the Lord Jesus and were baptized, Acts 18 and verse 8. Yes, Paul preached the gospel. That was his duty, to preach the gospel of Christ, the power of God unto salvation. And those who, who heard the gospel, who believed, were baptized. While some who were divisive argued over who baptized who, the emphasis was the Lord. He should have been the focus. The gospel of Christ, the cross of Christ, redemption that we have through Christ and his cross. That we believe in him, and because of our belief in him, our faith, we are baptized into him. Just as we see the example of the Corinthians in Acts 18 and 8. The wise gloried in their wisdom. The mighty gloried in their might. The noble gloried in their nobility, their birth. Paul said in this passage, no flesh should glory in his presence. It was because of God that they were in Christ Jesus who became the wisdom from God. It's because of God, Jesus Christ, they received the blessing of Christ of righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Again, note verse 30 and 31. We've looked at this chapter in its context, and now we see the passage, the passage that Paul quotes from Jeremiah. But of him, who's the him? here in verse 30. God, the Lord, but of him, but of God. Because of God, you are in Christ Jesus. Here are those who believed and were baptized in the Christ, who became for us wisdom from God, and righteousness, and redemption, sanctification. He became those, those things, and more. It's through, because of God, it's through Christ that we have righteousness. We have justification through the faith of Jesus Christ, and that we can live a righteous life. It's because of him that we have sanctification, that he has set us apart through his sacrifice for holiness. And it's because of him, his sacrifice, that we have redemption, that we are redeemed from our sins. Verse 31, that as it is written, and so he quotes from the prophet Jeremiah, the scripture. He who glories, let him glory in the Lord. Paul quotes from Jeremiah 9 and 23, where the meaning is that people should glory in the Lord God. Glory in God who sent his son and called the Corinthians, called you, into fellowship with him as Christians. There is no room for you to glory in yourselves, to glory in your own wisdom, or in your own might, or in your own wealth. In the end, these things do not bring life, but death. Glory in God who gave us his Son, through whom we have these things of righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, that we, through his sacrifice, can live a righteous life and look forward to the life of eternal life above in heaven. Jeremiah 9 is a wonderful passage. We see in the context, uh, context of the children of Israel and how that they had turned from the law. There were those who, who were doing things that were contrary to the law, and they began following the dictates of their own hearts. Jeremiah was immensely sad, and he urged the people over and over again to repent. Here in this chapter, we see he breaks momentarily with these words. Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. But let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord, exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth, for in these I delight. 
the message today is to glory in God. Of course, use whatever might, uh, whatever strength or wealth that you have in order to do the things that are righteous and just and, and love it, of love and kindness. Use whatever resources you have to do what is good and following the will of God. Perhaps it's the case today that you would like to become a Christian, like you see in Acts 18 and 8, where the Corinthians heard the gospel of Christ, hearing, believed, and were baptized. Now, it's true that some of the Corinthian brethren erred. They began to have contentions among each other about uh, various things they, they ought not to have done. However, that should not diminish the response overall of the church there and Paul's love for them, and that his hope was that they would repent of their sins. Jeremiah shed many tears, wanting so much the will of God for the people to repent of their sins. Paul loved the church too, and he wanted them to repent of their divisions, contentions, and to be united in Christ. If you're not a Christian, we'd urge you to become one. Think about it today. If you already are, but perhaps you have fallen away, you've become unfaithful, we urge you to repent of your sins. Turn back to God in prayer. Ask him for forgiveness. He, he will forgive you. We appreciate you being here today, and we hope that you have a wonderful week. And until next time, we wish you God's blessing.